Hi and welcome to this research methods revision video brought to you by tutor to you All of the content within this video is based on the advanced information guidance for 2022. Research methods, as you should know, will appear predominantly in paper two, but it can also come up in paper one and paper three. So as a result, this is a really good video just to recap some of those skills that you are looking for within the research methods sections of your A-level psychology paper. So before we get started, just a disclaimer that all of the materials used on this course are produced by Tutor to You and they are intended to reflect the style of the questions and mark schemes present on AQA A-level psychology exams, which are available in the public domain. Okay, so what you'll need for this video is a pen or a pencil and a piece of paper. What would be great is if you could answer the questions as we go along. And then after the three questions have been up, we'll compare the answers to a mark scheme so that you can kind of see where it is you are picking up your marks or maybe more importantly, where you're losing them. So what you can see on your screen now is quite common practice for research methods questions for psychology. It tends to start with some sort of passage or case study about a psychologist or a research wanting to do a research project. So here you've got a psychologist wants to investigate the effects of age on concentration. To do this, she gathered two groups of participants. Group one were aged under 40 and group two were aged over 40. All participants were asked to watch a five minute video clip of CCTV footage and were then asked questions about what they had seen. The number of questions each participant answered correctly were totaled up and they were given a score out of 10. And then you can see below the item, you've got some information, some stats in the box below about the mean number of questions that were answered correctly and the range. But for now, they're not really that important for the three questions you've got available. So the first question wants you to identify the operationalized IV and the operationalized DV in this study. The second question wants you to write a suitable non-directional hypothesis for this study. And the third question wants you to identify one extraneous variable that the psychologist would have to consider and suggest one way in which this can be controlled. So what I'd like you to do now is just pause the video, have a go with these three questions, and then we'll go through the mark scheme so that you can compare what you have written down to what the mark scheme was after. OK, so question number one was to identify the operationalized IV and the operationalized DV in this study. And there were two marks available for this question. So what you would have found is that you would have got two marks if you had to have identified both the IV and the DV and made sure that they were operationalized. You would have got only one mark if only the IV or the DV were correctly identified and operationalized. And it says note zero marks should be awarded if the IV and the DV are not operationalized. So essentially what you're looking for here is to make sure that you've got the IV You've got the DB and both of those you have written down in an operationalized format. Now, remember, operationalization, people get really scared of that term. People really panic when they see it in the exam. But all it means is to be really specific about what it is you are changing or what it is that the researcher is manipulating and what they're measuring. So what are the two conditions and what is being measured? So that is if you have an experiment. So what are the two conditions within your experiment? And how exactly are we measuring the DV? What is it that we are doing? So maybe the first time you read through this passage when the video was paused, you identified that age was the IV and the DV was concentration. Because we were changing the age of the participants and we were wanting to see what effect this had on the concentration levels of the participants. But we have to be really specific. So if you had to just put age in general, but not being specific about the two groups within the experiment, you wouldn't get any marks for the IV. So the IV wants you to look for the age of participants with one group being over 40 and the other group being under 40. So it's the second half of that sentence, which is super relative. If you just say age, it's not specific enough. What about age? How old are these participants? So you need to make sure when you are operationalizing your IV, you say the two groups that people are being placed into. In this case, we've got over 40 and under 40. 
The DB, again, if we're going to operationalize that, it's being really specific. So we know that the DB is concentration. But how do we know if someone is concentrating? How do we know how good or how bad their concentration levels are? So again, when you are operationalizing your DB, in this case, it's just saying be really specific. How are they going to measure that person's concentration? So in this case, you've got concentration measured by the participant scores that indicate their performance on a recall test after watching the CCTV footage. Now, what is really important to note here is that if you just put age as the IV and concentration as the DB, you pick up zero marks for a two mark question. You need to be really specific, push it that little bit further. What are the two conditions of the IV? And be really specific about how the DB is going to be measured. Okay, so question number two wanted you to write a suitable non-directional hypothesis for this study. And there were three marks available. So remember, whenever you are writing an experimental hypothesis, there are really three things that you need to make sure go in there. The first thing is condition one of your IV. The second thing is condition two of your IV. And the third thing is making sure that whilst you put the DB in there, you need to make sure that it is really specific and that it's in its operationalized format. So again, if we have a little look at what the mark scheme was after here, it said three marks will be awarded for a suitable, clearly written, non-directional hypothesis, which includes the operationalized IV and the DB from the study. Two marks will be given for a muddled or incomplete non-directional hypothesis. So, for example, where the IV and or the DV are not clearly operationalized. One mark for a vague or muddled non-directional hypothesis. So, for example, neither the IV or the DV are operationalized, but you've been able to write one correctly and have identified them. And then again, it says note at the bottom, zero marks will be awarded to answers that offer a null hypothesis or a directional hypothesis or a hypothesis that is not applied to this study. So essentially, the first thing you need to be thinking about is what language you should be using when you are writing a non-directional hypothesis, because this is the one that the question is after. So with a non-directional hypothesis, you're thinking that there will be a difference between the two groups within the experiment, but you don't necessarily know what that difference will be or what direction that difference will be moving in. And then a null hypothesis, you know, just means that there will be no difference. So with a non-directional hypothesis, the word you're looking for is something to do with there will be a difference between the two groups. So this was the correct answer that the mark scheme were given. And I'd like you to compare your answer to this one here. This is a perfect hypothesis. So it says participants in group one, who are the under 40s, will score differently on a concentration test than participants in group two over 40. So you can see here that those three things have been identified as part of the hypothesis. You've got group one, the under 40s, and group two, the over 40s. You've also got your DB in an operationalized format. So you haven't just said concentration, but the fact that they are going to score differently on a concentration test. So you're being really specific about how you are actually going to measure concentration levels here. And then you can tell it's a non-directional hypothesis because while we said they will score differently on the concentration test, we haven't said in what way that difference is going to be. Are they going to score better? Are they going to score worse? So again, those three things have been mentioned and you've made sure you've got the correct language in there for the non-directional hypothesis. OK, so question number three, identify one extraneous variable that the psychologist would have to consider. And really importantly here, it says suggest one way in which this can be controlled. So in other words, it's no good just identifying an extraneous variable and moving on. You have to actually choose one which you can talk about how you will control for it. So it says here one mark is awarded to an appropriate and relevant extraneous variable that is identified. So if you just identify the extraneous variable and it's appropriate, you would get one mark. But the other two marks come in for justifying how you are going to control for it. So it says plus two marks for an accurate, coherent and detailed suggestion of how the extraneous variable could be controlled or just one mark for a suggestion which lacks accuracy coherency or detail. So again, you can see here, once you've identified the extraneous variable, you then need to be really detailed in explaining how you are going to try to control for it.
Okay, so the mark scheme has suggested three possible answers here. So see whether your one is on here. The first one they suggested was the tiredness of participants and how that could maybe affect the concentration level of the participants. So they've identified their extraneous variable, tiredness of participants, but really importantly, they thought about how they are actually going to try to control for the tiredness of the participants. So they said this can be controlled by ensuring they all self-report between six to eight hours sleep the night before the study takes place. So you can see here how not only have they identified the extraneous variable, but they then thought about how they are going to control for that specific extraneous variable they've identified. It's a relevant control measure. If you want to see how tired your participants are, you can get them to self-report the night before how many hours sleep they had and made sure that they all had similar hours of sleep. Extraneous variable number two they've identified is the difficulty of the questions asked. So this time they said this can be controlled by conducting a pilot study. So remember, this is like a small scale version to check that the questions are appropriate and are not unexpectedly difficult to answer. And the third one they suggested is the quality of the CCTV footage. Again, they've gone further and explained how they are actually going to control for this extraneous variable. So they've said this can be controlled by ensuring that the procedures are standardised and ensuring that all participants observe the same CCTV footage on the same device. Now, these aren't the only three extraneous variables you could have identified. It does say to credit or that relevant material, but these were probably going to be the most popular ones given the question was to do with concentration. OK, so you've got a second item now. And again, this is all about understanding the questions. What are they actually after? So Gemma is investigating the effect of alcohol on fitness. She recruits 20 participants to take place in her study. Half the participants will be asked to run on a treadmill for three minutes without any consumption of alcohol while the other half will be asked to run on a treadmill for three minutes after consuming three alcoholic drinks. Each participant will then have their heart rate recorded before and after the study, and the difference will be calculated to determine fitness. Gemma hypothesizes the participants who consume the alcohol will have a greater increase in heart rate after completing the fitness task than those who do not consume alcohol. After conducting an differential test, the observed value was 28. And then you've got three questions again. So same setup as before. Pause the video here and have a go at the questions which are available to you. So the first one, identify the level of measurement that is being calculated in this study. Again, the second part of this question is really relevant because it doesn't just want you to identify the level of measurement. It wants you to justify why you have chosen that level of measurement for two marks. Question number two, identify which statistical test would be most appropriate to analyse the results with. Again, justify your decision, four marks. And the final one is identify one ethical consideration that Gemma should be aware of and suggest one way in which she can deal with this. And this one is for three marks. So pause the video here, have a go at the questions, and then when you are ready, just press play. OK, so for question number one, it said identify the level of measurement that is being calculated in this study. Justify your decision. So as you can see here on the mark scheme, it says one mark for correctly identifying the level of measurement, which in this case, hopefully you've got interval. However, there was another mark available for a clear and accurate justification. So you have to explain why you have gone with the option interval in order to get the mark for this one. So this was the answer which the mark scheme advised. Interval data was collected. So you can see here you've identified the level of measurement. But it says interval data was collected using heart rate, which is a scientific measurement that increases in regular intervals. So again, making sure you are really reading that question. You haven't just said interval data and moved on. You've then explained why you would have chosen interval data for this one. OK, so question number two, identify which statistical test would be the most appropriate to analyse the results with. And again, you've got this justify your decision. So in other words, if you just identify the correct statistical test, you'd only get one mark in this case. It's the justification, which is really important. And you can see you've got four marks available here for this question. 
So always be using your marks as an indication of how much you probably have to write about. Again, in other words, if you only write down the name of the statistical test, it's probably not enough to get you all four marks. In fact, definitely not enough on this occasion. If you write one or two sentences, probably still not enough as to why. So you're looking at the points available. Four marks, four points. So one mark for correctly identifying the statistical test. Hopefully you got this one right. It was the Man Whitney U test. Plus one mark for each of the following justification points. So the first justification point was that interval data was gathered, in this case, heart rate. The second point was that unrelated groups design was used. And the third point was that the investigation was looking for a difference between the two groups. So again, all of these three reasons are justifying why you have gone with the Man Whitney U test. And you haven't just said the statistical test and moved on. You're really justifying your reason for choosing it. It says note unrelated t-test is also acceptable. But again, you need that appropriate justification as to why you would have gone with it if you selected that one. And the final question for this subset, it says identify one ethical consideration that Gemma should be aware of and suggest one way in which she can deal with this. Three marks available. So in this case, you get one mark for the correct identification of a relevant ethical consideration. But again, the main part of your marks on this question comes from this suggestion of how you can deal with it or how Gemma could have dealt with it in this case. So you get a further two marks for an accurate suggestion on how to deal with the ethical issue you have identified with. Or one mark if it's a little bit muddled or you have a limited suggestion on how to deal with it. So you need to break it down here. One mark for the relevant ethical consideration, plus a further two marks for then stating how you can deal with that specific ethical consideration that you have selected. So in the mark scheme, we've got two potential options available here. The first one is protection from harm. So Gemma will need to ensure that the participants do not have alcohol in their system before they leave the safety of the study and supervision. So again, here you can see that it's identified that one ethical consideration first, but the main part from, comes from how you will actually deal with the ethical consideration you have chosen. So protection from harm, how might she be harmed? If she still has alcohol in her system, how are you then going to deal with that? You're going to make sure that she doesn't have alcohol in her system or the participants don't have alcohol in their system before they leave. Another one you could have gone for here was informed consent. So how is Gemma going to deal with informed consent? How will she gain the informed consent from her participants? So Gemma needs to make sure that participants are aware and fully understand the amount of alcohol they might be consuming and how this could affect their fitness or heart rate. Only when she's done this can she fully gain informed consent from the participants. Remember, you can never gain informed consent if your participants are being deceived or they aren't aware of the true aim or the true purpose of the study. So hopefully you identified one ethical consideration and then you were able to explain how Gemma could have actually dealt with it. Remember, when you get given an item or a case study, it's really important to use the names within your answer. It shows that you are applying your knowledge to the question. So protection from harm, Gemma will need to do this. Gemma will need to do that. And finally, there is just a little tip to help you work out what statistical test might be appropriate in different scenarios. So you can use mnemonics, but there's also the tutor to you decision tree to help you decide. So if you want to pause the video here and have a little look at the decision tree, You'll be able to see how you can use this tree to decide what statistical test you're going to use, because this tends to be one of the harder decisions people have to make in the exam. So the decision tree from Tutor to You can be a really good thing to have printed out in your bedroom, have printed out onto the wall, have printed out into a work booklet so that you can go back and forward to it just to make your decision of what statistical test you might use for a particular case study. So well done on completing this research methods revision video by tutor to you Hopefully this video has really helped you highlight how you need to use a mark scheme and also how to identify those commands words which are available in the question so that you know what that question is really after and how you are able to pick up all of the marks available for the question. So well done on completing the video and really good luck in your exams going forward.